Hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome in. Uh, this is a pre-recorded episode of Snap, so we are not live, but you can catch us uh, podcast, YouTube, wherever. Um, shout out the volume for having us here. Your favorite daily college football podcast, and uh, we got a lot of news to break down today. As um, it's something that broke right after the show yesterday. But uh, realignment was already kind of in the air. Ross Dellinger had a really good piece in Sports Illustrated talking about maybe what looks like what's coming next for all of college football and exploring mm-hmm. it all. Um, and then Brett McMurphy, right after we got off air yesterday, tweeting that Clemson, FSU, Miami, UNC, NC State, Virginia, and Virginia Tech are the Magnificent Seven, uh, which is mm-hmm. kind of like such a funny way to start this tweet. Uh, and then he says, these ACC schools – uh, reported have met, uh, excuse me, these AC schools, Ross Dellinger reported, have met in the past several months with lawyers exiting grant of rights to determine just how unbreakable it is the ACC deal runs through 2036. So I guess it's important re- because, Aaron, we now have seven schools very clearly um, trying to break out of the current ACC deal that they have. And the reason being is that it's exactly what Ross laid out in his piece of sports illustrated. They are just at a huge economic disadvantage, right? Um, yeah. Like they, they are paid. These coaches are and expected to compete with schools in the big 10 and the sec. Mm-hmm. And yet the revenues that they are getting um, just aren't even close. And like how many of you could make up a, it, no matter, no matter what the business is, uh, okay, so Big Ten SC are getting what, like 80 something million a year? I believe yeah, it's crazy. And then crazy where's yeah, the ACC right at? Is the ACC, I want to say ACC is at 30, but let's be maybe it's at 50, right? Let's just be generous, say 50. How many of you could keep up with the competition in your work if the other people were consistently making 75 or had 75 percent higher budgets from which to pull money to spend? It's It's just impossible. And so it leads Ooh. kind of a slow economic death. So with that staring the ACC in the face, I guess it makes all the sense in the world that we're hearing about the Magnificent Seven trying to find a way to break out. Yeah, they are. But I just don't know if it's going to happen. Or I think if it could have happened, they would have already done so. Because, I mean, this contract that goes for another you know, decade plus is just, it's, it's handcuffing them. Like you said, it, 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 it's similar to what we discussed yesterday with Florida. Not from a financial standpoint, but from a resource standpoint. How does Florida and why did Florida kind of fall by the wayside? Well, they didn't have the resources to compete with Alabama and Georgia. And then all of a sudden you have recruits who see that, who don't want to go there because they want the big, shiny, beautiful thing. So now all of a sudden you have, you have to serve two masters if you're a school. You have to serve the master of, hey, we want to have money so that we can continue to have the biggest weight room, facility, indoor facility, dining experience, all that. Big jets to take our players everywhere they need to go for games, all that. Like, you need money for that. Well, you also need money, not from you directly, but from your supporters to go to these players through NIL. So now all of a sudden you're in SEC school. You say, okay, you, want, you know what? We get $80 million a year or the Big Ten. We, we can make up for some of the money that we're losing to have some of our top boosters go to NIL. ACC, you can't do that. Because now all of a sudden you're going to cut into my budget, which is already significantly less than the SEC or Big Ten school, to use that money to pay kids. Well, then we can't pay for big time facilities. So they are in a really tough place right now where they're losing on the NIL front. They're losing on the resource front. And you just can't keep up with the Joneses. And we've seen that really hamper that conference now for for for, for quite some years. So, uh, yeah, if I'm them, I'm hiring every damn lawyer I possibly can to figure out how I get out of it. But a contract's a contract for a reason. And these TV deals aren't just going to roll over and say, you know what, we feel bad for you. So yeah, you can get out of it. Like, no, like they want their money and they signed you up for this and you're just a damn idiot for signing a contract that runs through 2036. It is weird though, right? Because generally in sports talk, the contracts that we talk about seem pretty malleable, right? Like player leverage, like all these things come into play where, okay, this guy's technically under contract, but he can be like, I'm going to make things so miserable for you that I'm going to force you to trade me, right? And so those are the type of contracts that we're we're used to dealing with. Or even like the new SEC deal that they have with ESPN, where they're just telling ESPN, look, we had a text in Oklahoma, we need you to come back to the negotiating table in good faith, right? So it does seem like all around us, there are contracts that maybe 
don't feel that airtight are real, but from everything I've read with this ACC deal, it must be the most fucking well-worded and yeah. tightly packed and tightly knit and locked up contract I've ever read because nobody can figure out a way out. And so I'm with you. Like if they could have been able to, they would have been. And this magnificent seven. Who writes a contract deals, to, for someone to get out of? Like who writes a contract that I mean? Why would no, you no, do no? But, but that's I mean, the point. I think is that loopholes can yeah. just somehow find their way in there, not by design. Yeah. But you can say, okay, you know what? This language is such that, you know, mm. really, if you interpret it this way, well, then you're so it's like lawyers are always looking for the way to um, semantic their way to an argument that can win them the case. But they've been looking at this forever, and to me, this whole yeah. magnificent seven play feels like a player being like, I mean, you better trade me. I'm going to make myself untenable, but I don't think they have the exact same recourse that these players have. So, I I mean, it mm. – and, and remember, the, one of the core problems is it's not just the exit fee. Yes, the exit fee is expensive, right? Like I think this year for FSU would be like $150 million to leave the conference. But they, the grant of rights part of the deal is the big yeah. deal because the ACC owns all – of the media rights of the schools. So they get to sell it, package it. The schools don't own it. So if you leave, not only are you paying an exit fee, but you have to buy those rights back. And the valuation of those, you could be talking about hundreds of millions. It's just not really feasible. So if we're looking at realignment, Aaron, this is how I see it. Um, it seems like, okay, obviously the SEC and the Big Ten are going to lead the way. They have the most money, everything else. Yes. Uh, I think the Big 12 is carving out a very interesting niche for itself where it will be a tier below them, but not wholly uncompetitive. And some years yep. we'll even beat them, right? Uh, I think the Pac-12 is going to die a pretty quick death. Quick death. In terms of, I think you'll see a group of schools poach from one place to another, and the next thing you know, they don't exist. I think, unfortunately, if you're an ACC fan, I think you're in line for a stagnant, slow, mm -hmm. uh, drawn out death of a thousand economical cuts, right? Like yeah. you are yeah. essentially a city that is being sieged and you're not going to lose some big battle with a thousand heads being chopped off in a day, but you're just going to slowly starve to death. And I just don't know how yeah. they get out of it. Yeah. I, I, I go to the big 12. I, 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 I'm somewhat anticipating a summer where you know you and I are at the SEC Media Days in Nashville. All of a sudden, we got like breaking news: the Big Twelve just added four schools from the Pac-12. Like I think that's I think that's in the cards because you know with the Pac-12, what they keep promising us a new deal coming, a new deal coming, a new deal coming, and every rumor we keep hearing just gets getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse to a point of like if I'm a Big Twelve school, if I'm Oregon or Washington or Colorado or Arizona, we talk about survival. And, and being able to have enough money to stay, to at least give ourselves a fighting chance, the deals that are currently being presented to the Pac-12 do not give these teams anywhere near a fighting chance to have success long-term to compete with the teams in the Big Ten and the SEC. So I, I do think the longer this team continues to push out, the worse it seems, the more likely you may see four teams from the Pac-12 leave to go to the Big, to the Big 12. You may see two teams, Oregon and Washington, leave to go to the Big Ten. Like I don't think that this is it for this year. I think we'll hear some news most likely this summer with the Pac-12 dying a rapid death, as you said, and the ACC continuing to die in a very, 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 very slow way because of the way this contract is worded. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting, right? Because uh, I've never thought about it in these terms, but essentially the ACC has the same problem that the Pac-12 does, not making enough money. Um, only yep. the Pac-12 doesn't have that contract. Guys can just leave yep. whenever they want. Whereas, uh, and the other thing is the ACC, I, I want to believe this is correct. So take this element with a grain of salt. I believe I remember reading too, that it's kind of such where even if the ACC wanted to change the deal and make it more friendly, that any changes kind of illegally open up things to defection. So it's almost yep. like even the people who have the nice contract have to kind of just stay there and like a Mexican standoff because if they make any changes, well, then they could potentially open themselves up. So it's 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 not good. And while I love that they're calling these schools the Magnificent Seven, um, I don't know what they're going to be able to do. I don't know if they'll do anything that magnificent. I mean, they're talking about uneven revenue sharing, which I don't like. Florida yeah. State's really hammering this. I would not agree to that. If I was one no, of the other schools, I'm not like State or Wake Forest, like. Screw you. Fuck you. Why the hell am I going to take less yeah. of the pay 
than you. Like, yeah, you could sell you want. Like, I may know at the end of the day that, you know, that you do bring more revenue in than, than we do, but like, we are not obligated at all to say, okay, we'll, we'll take less of money than, than you and you guys can get a, a alliance portion. Like, no, we need the resources just as much. And yeah, just shit sucks. Sorry, bro, but I'm not giving you any of my money. <laughs> Yeah, that's like I'd be like, I'd be like, okay, why don't you just go leave for the SEC? Oh, oh, oh wait, you can't. Fucking shut up. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not revenue sharing <laughs> with you, dude. Get out of here. Um. So I, yeah. So on the topic of realignment, I just, I, I, you know, it, who, uh, who will be the lawyer that will somehow find a loophole in here? Uh, if it hasn't happened now, I don't think it will. But maybe. Do you? Do we are? Uh, I want to hear your thoughts on 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 kind of what I brought up there, like, do you anticipate a, an interesting summer? Because I feel like it happens all around the media days where all of a sudden we're in some interview and all of a sudden news breaks and, you know, it's happened the past two years with NIL, with conference realignment, you know, it's happened the past two years with Texas, Oklahoma, and then this past year with USC, UCLA, right around the summertime. I mean, the timing, the, summer? the timing of it would make perfect sense. The timing of it make perfect sense because we're probably 60 to 90 days from hearing about the Pac-12 contract and – the leaders of the Pac-12 schools are very much on the record as saying all that, you know, the contract will be the main determining factor in what happens next. Like, even the Arizona president, when he had those crazy quotes about how, like, it's actually a way better deal than you think, and it's going to be better in the Big yeah. 12, and it's coming soon, even he basically left the door open saying, well, we got to see the contract first, and then we'll yeah. we'll make a choice. So, yes, uh, short answer the timing of that would make sense, but we, we'll see. Um there's a great piece in the athletic talking about tampering this week. And it, 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 it's, it's very representative of kind of the changing times that we live in when it comes to um, college football. And a lot of it deals with group of five coaches, right. And just how mm -hmm. brutal this current existence could be as the group of five is essentially um, going to become, or is in the process of becoming a kind of pseudo minor leagues for college football, mm -hmm. right? Football that is still good and even with one another, but will struggle to punch up a class. And Aaron, from where I sit, I just don't know that there's any way to stop it, right? Yeah. And it's because yeah. everybody's motivations are so easy to understand. Players want more money. They want to play on a big stage. Coaches want to get as much talent as possible to try to win championships. And fans and consumers, the people that drive all the money for advertising and everything else, they want to see the best teams possible. So, like, yep. yes, is tampering out of control? Do you have these Power 5 schools with massive spy networks, essentially, where they're talking to former 7-on-7 seven -seven coaches and high school coaches, getting players' ears, be like, hey, you know, if you're not happy, they're open up over here. Or what's this guy doing now? Like, all of this is going on. This is all true. But who cares enough to stop it? The coaches yep. don't want to rat on another. Like I said, the players want it. The fans want it. So, no, I just – I think it's inevitable what is going to happen to the group of five is they are going to become a pseudo minor leagues for the power five. Yeah. Th this, this is a, a, a tribute to our boy, Jacob Hester on this one. But the more I watch you know, like welcome the Wrexham or Ted Lasso, the more I'm like, why don't we just adopt the European soccer where the premier league is the big 10 and the sec. Then you got the tier below that is the ACC <clears throat> and the big 12. Then you got below that, you got the AAC and the MAC, whatever it is. And like, you just, you get relegated. If you're Vanderbilt football, well, sorry, you suck. You're out of the SEC. You get relegated out of yeah. it. If you're, you know, uh, Houston in the Big 12 and you have a great first year in, in the Big 12, boom, all of a sudden you get put up to the Big 10 or the SEC. Like, to me, I know it's never going to happen, but how awesome would that be if we did? Because I do think they do it right. Like, you know, the big boys get paid the big no, money. No, it is. They get... It's perfect. It is so well organized and done. It, it, and like this is the way this is shaping out to be, it already it's it's somewhat like that, but instead of it being by conference, it's just these players are going to funnel themselves up to the top by being yeah. the best players in the country. Yeah, it's it's objectively the coolest way to handle things from just a sports yep. uh, viewer perspective as it creates excitement at the bottom, it creates excitement at the top, it creates real stakes. But that is the problem at the end of the day, are these stakes? Because nobody is, like, why would Vanderbilt ever agree to this, right? Like, like nobody, like, in the, the bottom half of the SEC, they don't have the, to, the teams that would be threatened to be, well, eventually they would, like, you would have to prove that it was somehow going to be worth more to the majority's time 
because it would yes. make them money, right? But the problem is yep. that's inherently a system that that's going it's not going to favor the majority, right? It's going to work out for the best teams that make it into the premier into the Premier League. And so when you're talking about having an entire power five vote or group or like whatever to have to take place, you're just never going to get people to agree to risking losing a spot in the SEC. I mean, the they, they, it sucks. I just don't, I, I think we're, we're, we're going to get to a point at least in the next two years where we're going to have four conferences, at least four power five conferences, SEC, big 10, big 12, ACC. If we do find this magical lawyer who couldn't get the ACC and these teams out of the contract, all of a sudden you go from four to now there's only going to be three conferences. There'll be the big 10, the big 12 and the SEC where I would think like the big teams left in the Pac-12, Oregon, Washington, most likely go to the Big Ten. The top teams in the ACC, if they get out of it, Clemson, you know, North Carolina, FSU, Miami, NC State, however, like, the, the, the better of the Magnificent Seven will probably end up going to the SEC. So there will be a large gap of, okay, really the best teams in the country belong to two conferences with the big 12 kind of just being there as like a little, you know, redhead stepchild, you know, stepbrother, whatever you want to call them. Like at that point, like, yes, I do think relegation would be perfect when you do have two super conferences. Like that is what we're getting to. Yeah, if if the lawyer can figure happen. it out, uh, what the two mega would... conferences or relegation? No, two mega conference feels almost inevitable uh, because right yes. now you have just a natural talent so it's interesting i was when when i when i started this article on tampering i thought that one of the problems for group of five coaches was going to be just a pure numbers loss right that their numbers are being leached because guys leave bigger schools but then i thought about it, i was like okay that's not actually the case right it's because there is an osmosis taking place there like sure you lose one of your best players to one of these big schools but you also have someone who's buried on their depth chart come down to you looking for playing time, right? Yeah. So like a lot of times you will see a switch, but the problem, so it's not like the issue isn't being picked apart from a raw number standpoint, but it's the it's the direction of the players and their evaluation. Because if you're a group of five coach, you're constantly losing guys who are overachieving relative to their scouting yeah. point, and you're taking on guys who have underachieved. So then you have to, so yeah. you develop a good guy, he gets picked, then you get a bad guy that you have to develop into a good guy all short. And so like, that's got to be incredibly discouraging for a group of five coach where mm -hmm. you know that you're just like anytime you do really well, you're just setting your guy up to leave you. Unfortunately, as discouraging as it is, as much as it sucks, I don't know that any of it matters though, because it's also still no. not stopping group of five teams from being on the same playing field, right? All these group no. of five schools are all like Tulane, Memphis, whatever. They're all dealing with these same issues. Everybody's getting poached. So on their level of football, they are still even. And, um, and and yeah, so I, I I don't know like where where the motivation would be found for someone to want to change this. It's just kind of the natural evolution of the market. It is. It is the natural evolution, and now you throw money into it as well, where these kids are not only incentivized to go to Bama or Texas or Oklahoma or Georgia or Clemson because it's the better school, but now they're also the ones with the deeper pockets that you can get an NIL opportunity at too. So you're competing against that. Like if you're a, a, a you know, one of these group of five teams, you don't have a fan base or the resources to, you know, pay your top player $200,000. Where if you're a top player who balls out and you're a position that a Alabama needs, you know, that donor group can put together a six figure deal to get you out of there as well. So now you're competing against both things, the brand and the money. And you just, you, you, you can't survive. You hope, like you said, that maybe you can get a guy that you have to then redevelop who, who didn't pan out at a power five school or, you hope that there's just more high school players as well, because now all of a sudden these group of five teams, instead of you know solely focusing on developing high school talent, can say, hey, we'll we'll do seventy five percent instead of one hundred percent focused on you know getting high school kids. We'll say seventy five percent is high school kids, which now opens up twenty five percent more for talent from the high school ranks, where these group of five guys just have to be better getting high school talent and then and then developing those guys. But then unfortunately for them, the, the cycle continues. You get more high school guys, but they end up leaving after two years to go to a big time school once they do have success at your program. 
It's a minor leagues. There's nothing. There's no way around it. It is. Yeah, I mean, there, we're, 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 we're using a lot of words. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's all it is. Yeah, we're using a lot of words when really that is just it. It's the minor it's leagues. It. it feels inevitable, and I don't think there's any reason to fix it or any real desire to fix it. No. I mean, you can you can empathize with these group five coaches, but hey, it is what it is. Um, you know, so on yesterday's show, we had to sit here and I had to listen to you sing the Georgia fight song. And, you know, it's uh, you like, do it again cr- if congrats you on Dylan. Congrats on Dylan Rayola. Even though I can't wait for Lincoln Riley to poach him after the season when Mike Bobo proves that he sucks. And he's like, oh, shit, I want to go to USC. But whatever. Um, also, I mean, in this fantasy, right, Georgia loses because Mike Bobo sucks. And maybe they lose to LSU. As Jaden Daniels sat down with uh, 247 Sports, or was it 247? No, PFF College. Jaden Daniels sat down with PFF College, did a little interview. And, um, and, well, here's a great quote from Daniels. Asked about why he chose to return. Quote, that's the biggest thing for me. I want to win the championship before my time in college is done. Now we're here in year two. Coach Kelly gives all of the reins to me to go out there and be a leader every day. He told me that this is my team. In order to win a national championship, it has to be player-led. And I feel like we have that. And what's interesting to me as someone who talks a lot of LSU is that this is the first time where we've had something like that on record um, in terms of Daniels just talking about how much Kelly has kind of empowered him to be the unquestioned leader of the team. And when you talk about differences in Jay Daniels, Aaron, probably the single biggest difference is that last year he was a new guy, new culture, new teammates, new coaches, didn't know anybody having to figure all out. This year he is the guy, not the new guy. Yep. He is now the guy. And it should, I mean, as a quarterback, Aaron, how much does that help in what you're looking to accomplish? I think it's massive. I, you know, I love LSU. I was singing their praises as soon as I, you know, saw you after the game. You know, being super dad, taking videos of your daughter at halftime, and doing all that. With that my just fun, awful looking stuff. boobs, but yes, yeah. just awful, awful looking boobs. boobs. Which we're Make still sure like, we're still. I mean, I mean, I feel like we're doing. It's not, Are you, you, know, you doing your push ups? That's not a good yeah, angle. Yeah. That's not a good angle. I've been doing push ups, but here's the deal, dude. I also ate a lot of crawfish but, but, yesterday. The older I get, the harder that gets. A lot of salt. You feel very yeah. bloated, yeah. right? So we're gonna very be fine. But what, what did we talk about yesterday for, for, for Florida? We talked about the fact that they've struggled getting a quarterback or getting a consistent player to the quarterback, and that's why they yeah. have been in the place where they've been in. It starts with QB1, and and I, I think Jaden has taken some massive steps from last year watching him to watching him in, in, in the spring game and just seeing his footwork, talking to the players, talking to the coaching staff. There it is. I mean, there's a sense of confidence that we got our guy, and I would say this too. I think even more confidence in the locker room is not only in Jaden, but with Garrett Nussmeyer, because I think as a coaching staff, you can let Jaden be Jaden. You can say, listen, if you want to run the football, because that is one of the weaknesses on the offense right now is a little bit of a concern at the running back position. We can run Jaden 15 times a game. We can run 20 times a game. We can say, Jaden, guess what? You have developed the passer. We would prefer for you to sit in there and get through your reads, which you've proven you can do. But when shit hits the fan and it's a real game and there's flying bullets and you can actually get hit and it's not practice, if you resort to your old ways and decide to run the ball a little bit more, we're fine with that. Go do you. Because guess what? We have a, a one of the best backup quarterbacks in America right now in Garrett Nussmeyer, where if he does go down, you're still in a good spot. So you're not, you're not a handicap telling Jaden to protect himself, telling Jaden not to run the football, telling Jaden to be a pocket quarterback. Go be you, dude. Go do your thing. And uh, I think for him, that's freeing for him. I think it's freeing for the rest of the roster too. So uh, do you think LSU is actually championship good? Because, I mean, that's what Jaden Daniels is talking about here. You got UGA standing in the way. You're out here saying that Florida State's going to beat LSU week one. So I don't know that you actually believe they're championship good. Okay, well, you okay? You've been saying that though on snaps. You've been picking Florida State and then picking LSU to do good. So if you this was your mind, this was pre. This was pre seeing them live in the spring game. That like seeing those dudes go out there and play, and seeing Jaden's progression, and seeing what you know the weapons on offense look like, the offensive line, the guys on defense. You know, some of the guys they got in the portal. I think it's gonna be a great game. I don't think it's a game. You're taking head to head. Let's play a head to head game. Who are you taking? I think LSU. LSU I'll take LSU. I'll take LSU. No, no, LSU or Texas. Oh, LSU or okay, Texas. Yes. 
LSU. I think LSU is the top four team in the country right now. LSU or Michigan or LSU or Ohio State first. Oh, damn. I'm going to make this seem like LSU is the second best team in the country. I'll take LSU. I'll take LSU over Michigan, <laughs> okay, too. I'll take LSU, LSU over okay. USC. Uh, LSU okay. has a chance to be the second best team in America. There you wow. go, t There you there go. There we go. So we've now arrived at. I mean, that is the – see, and that's where I, I – maybe I'm just dinging myself trying to be too much of a homer. I arrive on the opposite side where I don't know – if I feel good about them being ready to take down your Ohio State to UGAs or maybe even a Florida State, but we're gonna find out. We're gonna find I do love Jaden Daniels finally getting an opportunity to build on all that potential that he flashed freshman year and refound last year. Because it seems yep. like he had a lot of dysfunction to deal with over there at Arizona State. And now he's been and we always talk nature versus nurture on the show. Now he's been put in a really good environment to find that long-term success. Um, Aaron, anything else in today's docket due to this snip week for your boy here? So we're just a couple more days yeah, away from welcome. joining you in the, uh, in the snip. Well, hopefully community. you get, also, you get a good snipping and I get, and I get a good news that, you know, it's the yes. six week mark. So hopefully uh, my swimmers are no longer viable. So fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope to be joining me. Did it hurt? I'm getting a little nervous the closer that we get. To. Yeah, it hurt. Get the, just take the pills, take the painkillers. Yeah, duh. I'm not an idiot. Literally, uh, my favorite part about surgery is getting pain pills. Um, yeah, right away, it's like the only right away. lining there is. Yeah, duh. I want to take them so fast that I'm like, hey, I need a second bottle, and they have to give it to me because it's not bordering on abuse quite yet. Um, <laughs> well, look, we have a we have a great show come for you for the rest of the week. Uh, we are not going to be live, uh, but again, days, you know, episodes, normal time, going to be hitting the, the, the podcast feed every single day. Uh, if you enjoy Snaps, huge thank you to The Volume and Con Coward for helping us do this show. Um, please sub to the pod wherever you do, Apple, Spotify, whatever. Help us continue to grow the show. Share with your friends. Rate it. Review it. We love you. And huge thank you to Ryan Brumley, Paul Ferry, and Pat Gunner, Danny Cardin as an Adagracia. We'll see you tomorrow for some more Snaps. Uh-huh.